I'm excited, you know, to sort of see where this conversation is going. It's something you know that you know, they have talked about about four times a day. It certainly has taken over the vast bulk of the conversations that we're having, especially with people outside of the data community, right? So the outside is there's a lot of attention and there's a lot of excitement around the topic. The outside is there's a lot of hype and trying to figure out what's real and what's not is challenging. So here to do our best to illuminate some some of this. Uh, I'll bring up Ren Lee, who is the head of our marketing team here at America. Jackson Taylor, our chief AI strategist, and then back on stage, Jeff Murray. Come on, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I, I, got, I wanted to start things for lunch, so just like doing a little stretch while walking up here. Um, but thank you so much for, for being here. And I think, you know, we are all thinking about a better day that day. And for the most part, a lot of us are using it on our day to day lives right now, but making it really work for the enterprise is a completely different story. And so that's really the topic of this discussion today. And no one really knows the direction we're going, but I think there are certain guidelines and certain best practices that we can be taking as we make through this journey. As Connor said, I run marketing, I've been doing marketing for a long time, and I, you know, for the marketers, we have been using machine learning for a very long time, whether it's, you know, on search advertising or looking at real time dynamic ads or looking at target audiences. But that has always been the realm of how do you take data that exists and categorize it to get that predictive model. And it's very different today when I'm looking at colleagues that are saying, we can use AI to generate the content. They are at its actual expression of creativity. And that, is, that does seem very new. So when Jed talked about, this is seismic, this is a landmark moment for us, um, I agree. So. Here we are. I am going to start with some lightning questions because they're always a bit of fun. Um, please answer short answers, yes or no, or your preferences. Jed? Yeah. Data yeah. storage, on prem or cloud? Cloud. Jackson, AI bias, avoidable or inevitable? Inevitable, fixable. Good answer. Jed, concerns around AI regulation, too restrictive or not enough? Too restrictive. Ooh. <laughs> Jackson, AI maturity, still at the tip of infancy or more prepared than we think? Infancy. Infancy, yeah. Jed, prefer AI team structure, centralized? Or de distributed? Uh, well, what's mesh? That word? <laughs> One of those. Some type of uh, pliable material, I think is where we're at these days. Mm. So you say she's safe? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Justin, um, AI often challenge. Is it technical or cultural? Cultural. And Jed, most important in AI algorithm quality or data quality? Data quality. Joe Nance, um, data quality. I think the room agrees. Great. Jackson, focus area for responsible AI. Is it thinking about job displacement or privacy infringement? Probably privacy. So many discussions, right? Good, good, good topics for dinner. And finally, when we think of AI's biggest hope and promise, improve productivity or enhance human creativity? I'll talk slightly longer here. I'm really a believer in uh, the latter, which I really hope ends up being true. I'm tired of improved productivity, just meaning we all work the same amount and, uh, you know, or even companies make a lot more money while we just keep having to work 50 hour weeks. I think we should have four days a week working. <laughs> I concur. <laughs> All right, um, you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, I lean towards the creativity side. I want, I want to be faced with harder problems. 
and I want the easy problems to be taken away with the AI equipment of work today. So hopefully we can do more creativity, more innovation, and work on problems that are so far we need collaboration. That would be really exciting. And I love a lot of the AI artwork you've been playing with. So I think it really is about enhancing creativity um, and making our, our lives still richer along with the productivity. Creativity also has bias too. So if I'm an artist and I create something, it's often um, a product of my own experience with mid-journey, you haven't played with it, but you want to speak an artist, it can generate new things that you would have never thought of and then you as the artist can react to that. So it's really fun. Yeah, I, from my side, we've been thinking a lot also about how do we ensure that creativity from the human experience, which is making the AI better and enhancing, you know, what are the rules of engaging there? So it's not about job displacement that came up, but, you know, how do we ensure that we think about the elements that are important to humans as we, as we use this? So we am delve into the longer form questions now. Um, so we're moving from AI really being in the realm of the visionary to every day. And I'm seeing all of your probably being flooded with new applications that are coming out, new technologies. I think on a weekly basis, I see hundreds and hundreds of new new apps uh, just just you know targeted for me. So when we think about those journeys, what are some of the truly practical and applicable projects that folks here can be thinking about to implement for the enterprise? You want me to say that? Okay. I actually think, so there's going to be a billion new things that we're going to be able to do with generative AI, but if you're thinking about what we could do right now, like what you could go home and work on, especially like an enterprise level outside of just asking and said, write your code for you or write your marketing emails for you in that individual fashion, is you can think about the existing problems you have, uh, classification, market basket analysis, uh, you know, and anything that you're already doing with regular AI, and try to find other than that to it. I've been really surprised about, I, and sometimes I'll, if I have a classification problem, I'll just ask, I'll specifically ask it to respond just yes or no, or just category A or category B, and throw all the data in there, and it does an incredible job. It's, it's shocking. So I think what, I, what I'm trying to say is, think about how you can apply generative AI to the problems you're already being asked. Do that today. Maybe I'll continue that a little bit here. I think anyone, everyone in this room can justify the GPT-4. I'm not talking about just justifying, justifying the GPT-4 license. You can also justify your time, your opportunity costs, interacting with it on a daily basis. Because it's there's so many units of work at the end of the day. I'm sure people in the room can relate to writing a complicated email. You, you have some constructive criticism or you're sending something internationally. There's some details around it, um, or you're consuming some content, you need summarization. It, it'd be very difficult for me to think of a role that didn't have an acceleration component or an increased creativity component. Um, if you're doing a marketing campaign, you can ask for five ideas, and then you as a human will pick one. So it just increases your ability to think outside your own box. Yeah, I think that's it. How do you advance? And then also thinking about I heard me talk about it this morning, you know, what if he's being asked to do a return investment analysis? Is that input of resources worth the output? And it's sort of the same question to ask. Where are they going to get the outputs that help enhance my day to day? I I just remembered something. So GPT-4 will write Apple script. So for anyone that uses a Mac, if there's some activity that you're doing, so I'll work on the storage on my Mac if it's annoying. Because so it's often a manual process, but I now have a single command called cleanup. It's this complicated Apple script bash command that will prioritize all the big files and search through the computer. It'll empty my trash. So you begin asking annoying tasks that you do on your Mac. If there's any developers in the room, I don't think they want to learn Apple script. Um, like, yeah, I had to generate some vaguely neo Celtic baby names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I've been getting website tags and asking for it to generate metallic lyrics for me. Very good. Um, so, 
as enterprises continue on this journey of digital acceleration, you know, we talked about the cloud migrations, all of the layers of technology, SaaS, business units. How can we help that people management, that change management in adopting Jungle AI? What are some considerations from implementation, usage, readiness of notification? Uh, so I did that first, but I think that everybody, uh, it's very easy to think of these cases like we all just did at an individual level. But uh, what I mentioned earlier, there's too much regulation. It's not that I don't think there should be regulation. It's just that legitimately enterprises don't know how to regulate this at all. And so they're not allowed to use it at all, right? OpenAI has blocked it. And many, if many of you log in your computer and you try to go to OpenAI, you probably won't be able to go to that website. Uh, I know a bunch of organizations that just disabled uh, Copilot in uh, VS Code. So I think bridging that gap is the first big blocker to this actually being used. It's hard to do. I think there's two major options that you can go for with bridging that gap. Uh, one is uh, using the existing cloud providers version, and the other is running your own locally, uh, often with it being enhanced by your own data or your own documentation. But that is the first implementation that organizations need to be thinking about. How do I do this uh, safely, or at least in a way that we can be safe? Do you think that might be some of the barriers right now where we're seeing a lot of consumer usage more so than enterprise? I, I think consumer usage is just, look, this is the fastest growing site ever. It went to 100 million users in three months. That took Facebook like three years, right? It took Instagram four years. It took TikTok a year and a half. This did it in three months. That's, we've never seen anything like this before. This is the first AI also that is consumer first. For a long time, AI has been driven by the enterprise. Consumers never even saw it. End users never saw what was happening. Here, it's just direct to them and enterprise is playing catch up. It's wild. I think a big part of culture change is understanding your audience. A lot of a lot of AI talks that are given are bad. They're te they're too technical. They're focused on how things work, and it, it can come across as a distraction to a C or a process owner or the business. And I think understanding, communicating in a way that someone understands how their process will be positively impacted, how potentially they could be promoted and where their role could be protected. I, I think there is a way to communicate that effectively to the business. It is helpful to have this consumer-based AI where light bulbs are going off and they're starting to think about it. But I think AI has historically, it's, it's been a little reckless. It's kind of been wild west. It's the last 10 years. There have been some pretty big failures in the industry, um, big ambitions that have disappointed. And so I think starting with the business first, what are the problems we're solving? engaging the business from beginning to end, but also communicating. They, they really don't care about the, the mechanics of how things work. They care more about the, the defense law terms. I think a big part of that is knowing the audience. You talk about AI failures, and you know, we've been talking about it you know, a lot this, this, this day around you know, a platform like AI who it helps with the democratization, the acceleration, and that trust of how can we, as individuals and humans, teams, organizations, think about the responsibility of harnessing this kind of power. What are some ways that, you know, the audience here could be thinking about using platforms like Dayaiku um, to, to ensure that they're avoiding some of those pitfalls or, you know, finding more success? This might give a little too much insight to who I am as a character, but seven years ago, I was running a business team and, um, a platform company was trying to sell to me at the time. I had a lot of arrogance. I, every member of my team had a PhD in physics. And I thought, whatever you're selling, if it's interesting, my team will build it in a month or two, which is so dumb. It's like the dumbest. But we, we were kind of running at that clip. And six months later, my team experienced a feature drift, drift excursion in the wild. We found out about it from a customer. We did nothing wrong. We did our data governance was sound. It was a vendor that had changed the data threshold. And I, I was not familiar of that. That I was a failure mode. And so working with the platform companies, I get the temptation to build it all 
yourself. Like I've been, I've been that person. I can build it all myself. I've got a great team. But we're in the platform companies. I'm realizing now I could not compete against that experience pipeline because it has the IQ experience to feature an excursion with one of our customers. Like it's probably not one time, it's lots of times that we've reacted to that, we build tools. And so ultimately I think the takeaway is someone has to pay the tuition. So you can we can give you the tuition. And we have a business that works because we build the tuition to a product, or if I went back in time, you can go off on your own journey. So just, just some brief words and thoughts looking back. Your individual institutional problems are the problems that you do as the ones you're expert at. Building a platform that adapts as new tools and new features and new things come out is what we do. And it's our promise that yeah, we're gonna be good at that. We better be. Great. Um, I'd like to open up for any questions from the audience. Um, sure. Um, one was, it was kind of a two-part question. What is, how, how could you use GenAI um, on like regular tabular data? If my data is not text strings, how am I going to do it with a bunch of numerical fields, right? Or if it's a combination of categories and numerical fields, which is what we've all been working with for the last like, 15 years, right? Um, and then the second question that you had was, all right, what, what, where's the explainability factor? Um, so for the first question, uh, GenAI is not to be perfect for everything, but I think we have a preconceived bias. I think we've been throwing away a boatload of text data because it's a pain to work with. Or like TFIDF is like only source of good, right? Uh, and grants are only source of good. So instead they're like, well, you know, we'll do this with our text data, and then it creates like 10,000 fields and it's way slower to train on and all that kind of stuff. I think where GenAI comes in really handy is you can use it on that text data and then take the output of your Gen AI and put it into a regular model along with all your existing numeric and categorical data that uh, you know regular models do a great job on. So it can be a fantastic feature generator and enrich what you already have. As far as you know, being able to do explainability, you were talking about this last night that GPT-4 can explain how GPT-2 came up with the solution, but it can't explain how it came up with it, right? Uh, which is pretty interesting. Like, if it can't even say how it did it, how are we going to? So, yeah, it's a big problem. Some interesting things that we've been thinking about is tracking response drift over time. So, basically, you keep running the same question against a model, um, and then you see, it is the model changing the way it's responding? Is it exactly the same? Is it slowly shifting over time? This is especially useful if you're, you know, plugging into an external API that you don't really know how often or when they're changing, which is basically then you're tracking some type of uh, whatever Manhattan distance or something like that to, to see how, how fast your uh, the responses are changing. But yeah, it's a big open question, for sure. Yeah, I, we talked a little bit earlier um, from one of the panels around prompt engineering as well. So. If we're thinking this feels a bit like witchcraft and we don't really know, but we need to understand how to get the outcomes we're looking for. And, you know, as we change over this certain regulations that seep in, as um, we were talking about with OpenAI, you're seeing different answers coming through. How do we document it in a bite-sized way? I think that, that kind of um, empathy towards the people who will be using the, 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 the models who will be using this technology is important. So I really appreciate that question because it's not just about getting the output, but it, it's continuing to make sure there is governance and that everyone can be using it together with an organization. The, the quick thought to add, um, with some of these issues that have to be addressed, I don't, I hope that people in the room don't think that it has to say, well, we'll just wait till these can address because one of the immediate issues that this is for all of us is our foundation is this Swiss cheese. There's some of the holes in our foundation knowledge gaps that we don't know. If you brought the most brilliant applied scientists in the world, a panel could sit down and we quickly figure out, oh, they have some gaps in their foundation. So that's an immediate when you get today interacting with generative AI, you're less likely to miss something. You can pick, pick a topic, you know, what are the latest algorithms and then what are the latest algorithms and any topic doesn't matter. And it will stack or you build this and we get well to rank the scores. And you as a human ultimately can decide, oh, I'm glad I didn't miss that. Especially when they fix the 2021 bias 
<laughs> we keep waiting and like, I'm ready for 2023. Uh, what was the fun question you were pitting yourself against last night? Oh, <laughs> um, and there's safeties in place where it will not tell you what an article believes in God. Yeah, but you can really lean in trying to have it decide a score. You can kind of see GPT fighting this. It will give you an art and art score. Uh, anyway, and argument quality. <laughs> the word against, yeah. Um, but yeah, we don't want you to have this stuff. I'm tension to find out. Um, you know, I see the red light blinking, so I think we don't have the time, but I'd love to just have, you know, final thoughts on this pretty incredible moment that we're living through in our lifetimes right now. Uh, what are some you know, thoughts as, as we sort of close this panel and continue the conversations um, in your individual groups and dinners tonight? I've lived and breathed deep learning for three years. I built and sold a deep learning company. I had a very negative perspective that deep learning would not take us to AGI. That deep learning was fundamentally flawed and we needed something else all the way until ChatGPT showed up. So I, I'm so excited about what this means for the industry. I, I don't, don't think we're missing. We, we have the fundamentals that we need to go all the way. I get genuinely shocked every day. Like, well, I cannot believe that this works as well as it does. So, yeah, good times. So we're all delighted. Thank you so much. And um, we hope you enjoy the afternoon sessions. And I'll turn it back over to Connor.